Okay, we are ready to go. We're going to start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study tonight, is how to overcome through the seven churches, and we are with the church of Laodicea. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this day of life. We thank you for your, your grace and your guidance for us. We want to thank you, Lord, for safety that you give us day by day, and we see with the world as challenging as it is with our gas prices rising and life not being quite the same as normal, Lord, we recognize more and more our need for you. Lord, as we look at this study of the Laodicean church, the church of the last days, our own days, the picture of our own world at this time for the final church in the book of Revelation, Lord, we ask that you would join us tonight, pour out your Holy Spirit, and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Sources for this series, the first one is always the Bible. The next one, you'll see Mark Finley's book in the middle here, but these other five books, Plain Revelation, Revelation of Jesus Christ, Understanding Daniel and Revelation, God Cares, and then an old one, but a very good one, by Uriah Smith called Daniel and the Revelation. And then a few of the other links, video series by Stephen Bohr, PowerPoint notes from Pastor Travis Smith, and then there's a young man named Pastor Giancarlo de Miranda who did How to Overcome Through the Seven Churches of Revelation, and that is kind of the foundation of where this class came from. So if you recall, the seven churches are on this postal route, and if you think the island of Patmos, if you look at the arrow from Laodicea, on through Patmos to church number seven, which is the church of Laodicea, you could almost picture John looking off in the distance, maybe seeing some of these uh, ancient places here. He could look across, he could see Ephesus, He could look across and he could see the church of Laodicea. These were approximately 30 miles apart if you look around this postal route. But if you notice also along the line of the arrow, there was a trade route between Ephesus and uh, Laodicea. And we're going to see in a little bit that Paul made his way along that trade route at one point. Laodicea is still a number of ancient ruins from the city, and the one that looks like it has a little hole in it is what they called an aqueduct. And that was for transmitting water from places far away from there. A couple of the cities, one Colossae in the Bible, when you think of Paul's letter to the Colossians, was from one of the cities where there was water that... Uh, they tapped into to bring down to Laodicea. And another area was called Hierapolis that was in that same area, and it was famous for the hot springs that they had. People would go there for mineral hot springs. Some of the ancient streets, if you notice, the one with the pillars all along the side and then the roadway down through the center, One of the temples that was there, this is they referred to as Temple A, but this is the most interesting one that I saw there, the church at Laodicea. And you you could get very excited in saying, that's it, that's the church. But one thing I notice when I I look at uh, uh, travel videos and things about the Middle East, when you see somewhere like... uh, in Jerusalem or the area where it's talking about the birthplace of Jesus or the tomb of Jesus. And you look and there, there's one here and then there's one here and there's one over here and each person has got that, that tomb. But it, it's hard to tell sometimes with the commercial that some people want to have tourists come for that. But it's hard to tell if you actually have the real church or if it's some ruins that could be called the church. So the last of the seven messages 
was addressed to the church in Laodicea, and it was 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia, and 100 miles east of Smyrna. And the meaning of the name Laodicea is a people adjudged. And that word adjudged is similar to just using the word judged, but it has to do with a civil judgment that has been made. So that name actually brings out the picture of a group that is judged. And we're going to find out when we look at the timing here and we think of the Jesus in Prophecy seminar that we had earlier that talked about the time of the coming of the judgment. That coincides with this church Laodicea that, that is the church that is during that time of judgment. So a man named Antiochus II, who was a king of the Seleucid dynasty, which was one of the four groups that broke up after Alexander the Great, when his kingdom fell apart after he died. So Laodicea was situated in an area that they called the Lycus Valley, and it was on a major trade route between Ephesus and Syria. And because of its location, it was one of the great commercial and financial industries of the ancient world. So there was commercial, financial, and industrial prosperity, and the success of the city filled its inhabitants with pride. And one of the examples of that that the historian Tacitus talked about was in 60 AD, there was an earthquake there, and rather than having the uh, Roman government come in and rebuild that, they said, no, that, that's okay, we got it. Don't, don't worry, we'll take care of that. They, they had so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. When you think of uh, Paul's missionary journeys, one of the areas that he traveled was through, if you look um, just above Pamphylia, the little arrow is going down, and you'll see it touches Laodicea, and then it goes on over to Ephesus. So Paul was following a land route there that was one of the trade routes going in between Laodicea and Ephesus. The commercial activity in the city made Laodicea a great banking city. And we'll see as we look at the message to the city, it has something to do with gold. And one of the reasons was they had a large amount of gold stored up because they were so rich. It was famous also for wool in that area, and they had clothing and types of uh, carpets or rugs that they shipped to many different areas. And finally, they had a famous medical school there, and they had a reputation for a particular type of ointment for eye diseases. It was from Phrygian powder. Phrygia was a place during that time. It was one of the uh, cities there. The powder was mixed with oil, and it was used as a treatment for the eyes. So in spite of all its prosperity, they had one problem. With that aqueduct that was bringing the water down, you would think it might be bringing nice, cool water from the mountains. But as it made its way along, the water became heated, and by the time it got to them, it was lukewarm. So that was one of the problems in the city, and we'll see as we read the words of Jesus, he uses each of these items that were characteristic of the city in his messages to the city. Now, in the SDA Bible Commentary in volume 7, page 60, it says, Laodicea was a prosperous commercial city in John's day. It was within a few miles of the cities of Colossae and Hierapolis. And at an early date, there were Christians in each of these cities. By the time Revelation was written, the church at Laodicea had been in existence for about 40 years. And Paul took an interest in the congregation, and he directed the Colossians 
to exchange epistles with the Laodiceans. So if you look at in Colossians 4 and verse 16, Paul says, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now what's wrong with that picture from our perspective? We don't know of any epistle to Laodicea. It's lost somewhere in history. But there actually was one. Mark Finley, in his book, Understanding Daniel and Revelation, which Tierra could pull out and read for us at the moment, <laughs> says the Laodicean church is contented. It is complacent. It is compromised. It believes that it needs nothing and it completely fails to understand its true condition. Laodicea is the church of the last generation before Jesus returns. Jesus' message to Laodicea calls us to develop faith in spiritual strength of character in the last days, just before Jesus comes, that will carry us through to his kingdom. When you think, what does it need to carry us through? Just look around you and think of the last few years and look ahead and understand we're going to need some carrying by the Lord as we go through these experiences. Laodicea is coupled with 1844. And if you recall the Jesus on Prophecy where we talked about the judgment period and the interpretation of Daniel 814 is where the date, 1844, was arrived at. So from a historical perspective, there's general agreement among Seventh-day Adventist expositors that the year 1844 should be considered as marking the close of the Philadelphia period and the beginning of the Laodicean period. That would represent the church of our own day. Now, if you recall, <clears throat> when we were looking at the parts to each of the letters, that Jesus has written in Revelation began with an address to an angel or to the elder of the church, went on to a description of Jesus, went on to something there that's missing. Yes, the affirmation or commendation. There was nothing good to say about this church. Number four was the rebuke. Five was the exhortation. Six was the statement, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. And then number seven, it was a promise to the overcomers. So should that concern us that there is no commendation for this church? Yes. It's like he has nothing good to say about the church. Although Jesus has no commendation for the church of Laodicea, he's not quite ready to give up on her. Now, if we look at Revelation, you can look in your Bible if you'd like, if you want to pencil these things in. But if we look at where these six items are located, starts out in Revelation 3, 14 through 22. It says, To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, so that's his address to the pastor, these things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And we're going to explore what do each of these things mean. But that was the description of Jesus. The next area is the rebuke from verses 15 through 17, where he says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. What was the water like around Laodicea? It was lukewarm, and the people were lukewarm. He says, because you are lukewarm, you're neither hot or cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about vomit. <laughs> But he says, because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy and have need of nothing, 
And you don't know you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. The exhortation comes. What does he expect these people to do? He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So he's picked out the, the gold and the white robes and the, the eye salve to kind of use them in his exhortation as a way to reach these people because they're familiar with those things. Finally, his promise. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And finally, there is the, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Now, why did I just read that prophecy to you? I was looking for a blessing. God says we'll get a blessing if we read it. So I get the blessing for reading it. You get the blessing for hearing it. So we think of Jesus standing there amidst the lampstands, holding the stars in his hands. We start to look at the message that he has. It says, these things, says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So this description of Jesus is given to us in this way because there is a connection with chapter 1 and verses 5 and 8. And as you noticed, with each of the descriptions of Jesus, there was a connection in chapter 1 that you could look at. You could see the description there and you could tell, oh, this is Jesus he's talking about. So in chapter 1, it says, Jesus, the faithful witness, the Alpha, the Omega, and the beginning. When we think of the term amen, this term applied to Christ is compared with Isaiah 65, 16, where in the Hebrew, the Lord is called Elohi Amen, the God of Amen. And in this present passage, it could be understood as saying Jesus is the truth. His message to the Laodicean church is to be accepted without question. What do you usually say when the pastor says something that you agree with in the sermon? Amen. amen. So that's exactly it. When you think of the amen, Jesus says, I am the amen. I'm the final word on this. So he's the faithful witness in that he is the perfect representative of God's character and will to mankind. If you look in John chapter 1, verses 1 and verse 14, it gives that picture of Jesus who has come into the world to testify of the Father's holiness and love. When we look at the description of him as the beginning, sometimes when people see the beginning of the creation of God, they say, oh, God created him first. No, what it's saying when you look at it, it's declaring that Jesus himself is the creator. He is the beginning of the creation work. He is the thoughts of God made audible in our world. Why are these things important? If you look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ. And what it's bringing out here is that in order to change the lukewarm, hard-hearted church of Laodicea, it's going to take creative power. It's going to take the type of power that spoke into the darkness and created the light. It's going to take that same kind of power. It's going to take Jesus as the creator helping us with this situation that we're in. Revelation 3 in verses 15 through 17. And know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Why do you think he wants them to be either cold or hot? Pick a side, you know that you got a problem, you know what side you're on. But when you're lukewarm, you're just kind of drifting along. You're good with warm, you're good with hot, you're good with cold. You don't care what's going on, you just kind of feel like things are okay. In the commentary, it says it's been suggested this figurative expression, lukewarm, must have been particularly meaningful to Christians at Laodicea because one of their chief landmarks was a waterfall over which a stream from the hot springs at Hierapolis flowed, leaving mineral deposits. Laodicea's water was not from that hot spring, but it carried some of the mineral-type deposits that were seen in that hot spring. So lukewarm water was something that was very familiar to Laodicea. So when Jesus use that term, it was something they were familiar with. Continues on, the tepid spiritual condition of the Laodicean church was more dangerous than if the church had been cold. If it's cold, you know it's got a problem. If it's hot, you're happy that they're on fire for the Lord. But lukewarm Christianity preserves enough of the form and even the content of the gospel to dull the perceptive powers. People are content to go and sit in church without really having a connection with Jesus. They're content to have some kind of a form of religion, but not really have the connection with Jesus. It's almost impossible to convince someone of their great need or how far they are away from Jesus when they're in that lukewarm condition. Now, we're on to talking about vomit. (laughs) What's Jesus talking about when he's talking about vomit? I'm going to share a Bible verse with you here. Leviticus 20 in verse 22. He says, You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to, to dwell, may not vomit you out. So Jesus is saying, I, I feel like throwing you out of this land, but I'm not ready to do it yet. So I've got hopes for you yet. So he's referring to them potentially missing out on the promised land because of their lukewarm condition. So when we look at the description of Jesus, the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, what Jesus is saying here is that though you say you're rich, you're doing well and you don't need anything, I've come as the truth, the final word about your situation, and guess what? It's not good. But he says, I, as your creator, am able to help you if you will let me. Revelation 3, 18 and 19, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see, For as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Does Jesus want to lose the Laodicean church? No, he wants them to repent, turn to God, and to be a part of his kingdom. He's given his life 
for Laodicea. Now he counsels them to buy gold white garments and ISAV, things they were famous for. But these items are not offered for free. What does it take? What's the cost for them to get these items? If you look on your screen. Yes, they have to give up their pride, their complacency, their self-sufficiency in order to experience what Jesus wants to share with them. So Jesus stands at the door and knocks. We're going to unwrap this a little bit. What is this gold that he's talking about? If you look at references in the scripture to gold, 1 Peter 1 and verse 7, it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus wants to give faith that is more precious than gold. He wants it to be, if you look in Galatians 5, 6, it says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith, working through love. So this gold is a picture of faith that he wants to give us that works through love in reaching people. How about the white garments? When you look at Isaiah 61 and verse 10, it's talking about a robe of righteousness. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and a bride adorns herself with jewels, he has adorned his people with the garments of salvation. We might look in the world and see all all kinds of jewels and, and ornaments on people preparing for a wedding, but... For Jesus' preparation here, he says, I'm giving you my robe of righteousness. He's talking about his life credited to our account. And that's case closed if you want to walk into heaven. If you got that, you're welcome. And finally, the ISAV. When we look at that in Ephesians 1.17 and in 1 Corinthians 2.14, talks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance. It's talking about spiritual understanding. And that's something that the Holy Spirit brings to us. He says, the natural man does not receive the things of God. That's why you can have a Ph.D., sit down with a Bible and look at it and say, I don't see anything here. It's because they have no spiritual discernment. Our foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the things of God are a puzzle for someone who has no spiritual discernment. So Jesus says, I want to give you this spiritual discernment so that when you look into my word, you can understand it, you can have hope, and you can be saved in my kingdom. In the book, Plain Revelation, it says the last church goes through the motions of great political, religious, and secular problems. Are we in any kind of problems at this point? Lots of problems. It faces challenges not seen by any previous generation. Yet the church is self-sufficient and lukewarm and it struggles with its authenticity. And Christ's warning to this church has far-reaching implications for all who are part of that church at the closing period of this earth's history. When the coronavirus came along, everybody thought, well, we have the scientific community. They'll take care of us. And two years later, we said, wow, what happened here? Now now we have this war coming on. We think, well, these 
these, the politicians will take care of it. They'll, they'll get a peaceful settlement here. Yet we see they're, they're, they're not handling what needs to be handled. When Jesus looks at his return and people coming to him at that time, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? and done many wonders in your name. And he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work, what? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. So he's talking about people that, that say, Lord, Lord, we're doing this. We have this great praise team. We do all these wonderful things for you. And he says, yes, but are you obeying me? You say, well, we didn't know that went in there too. But Jesus is saying, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Because Jesus knows that, that when he gives a new heart, it is like the heart in Psalm 40 and verse 8, where it says, I delight to do your will, O God, because your law is written in my heart. He brings a different condition of the heart and it is recognizable by people walking in obedience to him now it's interesting we saw earlier in the church of smyrna that it was described as poor laodicea is described as rich smyrna was physically poor financially poor but they were spiritually rich Laodicea was in possession of all of the riches they could ever desire, and yet they were poor. James 2 and verse 5, he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Now, no offense to those who are rich here, but I can remember many times going out into the community uh, for what we call an in-gathering, where it was collecting funds to help needy people, and it seemed like all of the fancy and rich homes that you went to, you'd get the door slammed in your face, but in the, the areas where you'd come upon a poor person and you wouldn't think, wow, they, they don't have two nickels to rub together they'd be the ones that would give to help these other people. So Jesus offers a remedy here. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. And we're going to think, what is he talking about? He's going to dine with us. When you look at this door, it's under the control of man. Each person can open or shut the door. Christ awaits each man's decision. It's the door to a person's soul, a door to their heart. And Jesus knocks at the door of the emotions. What, what would the picture for each of us be if we looked at that? As Jesus is knocking, are we sitting there watching the TV or what are we doing that, that causes us to not have room for him to come in at the moment? What does it mean to eat when Jesus is talking about it? In Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, Your words were found and I <coughs> ate them. Your word was to me the joy of and rejoicing of my heart. How do we eat with Jesus? In his word. It's in his word. We listen to the preaching of his word. We read his word. We study his word. Yes, we allow him to 
through his Holy Spirit, give us spiritual understanding and discernment. And it's satisfying as a meal when he does that. So the Bible refers to that as eating his word. In Isaiah 55, verse 1 and 2, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Now, how do you go buy something with no money? It's a challenge. He's talking about something else here. He says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for things that don't satisfy you? But he says, listen carefully to me and eat what is good. So we take the time to eat with Jesus. We enjoy those things by taking the time to listen to him. He is the bread of life. If we run off in the morning taking no thought of him, run off in the evening to places that we have to go to, but with no thought of him, we're not taking the time to eat. And in the book Christ Object Lessons, page 364, it has a, a very short sentence there, but it's very important for us to understand what it means. It says, as in the natural, so in the spiritual world. And what she's bringing out is that the picture of you eating and being satisfied, or the picture of you not eating for four or five days, is the same in the spiritual world. You'll get just as weak, you'll get just as emaciated spiritually as you would physically missing that food. Jesus offers the remedy. What's in those boxes? He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him, and he with me. We think of this, this word, dipneo, is to eat a meal. And it's related to Revelation 19.9, where it talks about the great marriage feast. And I'd like to look for a moment. It says, He said to me, write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, Matthew 22, verse 33, verse 3 through 14, I believe that is. But, uh, it talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a king who is preparing a wedding banquet for his son. And he sent his servants to those who were invited to the banquet, inviting them to come. He said, go and tell those who have been invited to come. The banquet is ready. But what happened? They didn't show up. They paid no attention. One of them went off to his field. He had to check out this new field that he got. Another went to his business. Some, it says, he went off to try his team of oxen that he had just bought. And some of these things you think, hey, why would he buy the thing if he didn't check it out beforehand? And he might be just like one of us jumping in a new car and saying, I'm going to drive my car for a while. I don't have time to go to this wedding. So he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So here's a picture of the heavenly banquet and the invitation being given initially to the Jews and then being opened to the Gentiles, to all of them, which the Jews were supposed to invite in the first place anyway. They were supposed to take the gospel to the world. But he sent his servants out and he said, go into the corners and invite anyone you can find. Find anybody that you can think of that would be willing to come. When I was like a young boy, probably about 12 years old, I went to a birthday party for a friend that we had in the neighborhood. And my brother and I went to his party, 
And they had a table that was probably about as long as these two tables put together. And the birthday boy was seated down at that end of the table. And my brother and I came in and we were looking at this long table. And we found out we were the only ones who had come to the birthday party. And this poor boy sat there. We ended up moving up the table to be close to him. But it kind of gives you the picture here. Jesus is inviting people to his kingdom. He's wanting people to be there, to be a part of it. So when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed there was a man there not wearing wedding clothes. Where else have we heard about a garment tonight? Yes, we just read about the garment. Jesus wants to give us that garment. Now the tradition in this time when this parable was written that if a person gave a feast like that, they supplied a garment for the people to wear. And what this person who was in the uh, banquet there was saying to the person who was giving the banquet is, my stuff is good enough. I don't need your stuff. I don't need your robe. And unfortunately, that's what some people are saying to Jesus. They're saying, I think my righteousness is good enough. I don't think I really need yours. Big mistake. We were down in Ecuador one time visiting our daughter Carrie, who was there as a student missionary, and we saw this group. They were going for a wedding into a building, and we were just we were dressed in our blue jeans and sweatshirts and just out for a hike. And we saw them walking into this building, and we thought, what's an Ecuadorian wedding like? So we kind of walked up to the window, and we were looking in the window, and then the, the mother of the bride came up behind us, and, and she invited us to come in to this wedding, and we're thinking, we, we, we look terrible. <laughs> but she was so gracious, she invited us to actually come in and sit in the wedding to see what it was like. But Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. Few are willing to actually enter in to where he's calling them. The time of the harvest has come. The marriage supper is about to begin. And Jesus, with a promise in his hands, is knocking one more time to see who is willing to come and to be a part of that banquet. Revelation 3.21 he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. This is not by our own works. This is by relying on the blood of Jesus. This is by relying on sharing the message of Jesus with other people. In the book, Plain Revelation, it says it's significant while the number of promises to the other churches increase in proportion to the decline of their spiritual condition. If you recall that, we, we had one for the first church and then two for the next and three for the third. And then all of a sudden for Laodicea, they get one. But that one thing that they get is to be with Jesus. And he's enough. 1 John 5, 11 to 13, it says, And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of God. Of the Son of God. So if you remember the old Cracker Jack boxes that the prize was in the box, that's the way it is with Jesus. You don't get eternal life apart from Jesus. You don't just say, Jesus, give me eternal life and I'll go out and do my own thing. The eternal life is in Jesus. You get Jesus, you get the eternal life. So Laodicea is in a terrible condition but Romans 5.20 tells us, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. 
Jesus has good news for Laodicea. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So these messages have a universal application. They apply to the church in the day that John was writing. They apply to the church later on in history and now in our own day. The message, especially to Laodicea, applies to us. So the question you might ask, what can we learn from the experience of the church of Laodicea as the last church before Jesus returns to this world? So there are a few things that I think we can learn here. One is that though we are Laodicean and lukewarm, Jesus still loves us and wants to help us. Number two, Jesus holds in his hands gold, that is faith that works by love, the white raiment or white garment, a robe of righteousness, which is his life credited to my account. And finally, the eye salve, which is spiritual discernment to understand his word. And finally, Jesus is still knocking at the door and hoping that we will let him in. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says that, that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's wanting everyone to turn to him and to be saved. So question, how do I go about opening the door to Jesus? I'm going to share a little bit about how I did that many years ago, and I'm going to give you the very short version. I was working on something at work. I had no time for Jesus. I had no interest in Jesus or anything spiritual. Marilyn at that time was pursuing the Lord. But I was working on some high-voltage equipment at work, and we were working from early morning till late in the day, and... I was going back and forth, testing things and moving probes and testing things and turning things on and off. And at 4.45 p.m. on October 12, 1978, <laughs> and I can show you the exact spot on the floor, but I stepped into a live electrical enclosure with 15,000 volts of electricity there, and I felt like somebody hit me on the back of the head with a baseball bat. And I fell out on the floor, and when I opened my eyes, I just looked up and I said, thank you, Jesus, that I'm still alive. And I said, if you're real, I'm going to invite you to come into my life. As simple as that, what do you do to open the door? You just say, Jesus, come on in. Say, I'm through fighting against you. So when you look at something like this, for myself or anyone else, I can't give you my experience with Jesus. But I can promise you that if you open your heart to Jesus and invite him to come into your life, he'll give you an experience with him as well. So how do we begin? Three things that I would suggest. Number one is prayer, which is asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit that we might understand God and his words for us. Number two would be Bible study, not to learn all kinds of technical details that we can quiz other people on and feel like we're really smart, but Bible study to get to know Jesus. And this Bible study is different than your Daniel Revelation type Bible study. This is time in the morning that you spend with Jesus just saying, Lord, I want to know you. I, I don't know how that works. Show me somewhere to go. Show me something to read. And he'll do it. He'll give you a, a powerful blessing. And finally, share what you're learning about Jesus. Now, notice I didn't say go out and show someone that you can recite all the books of the Bible. I didn't say go out and tell them that you can recite a, a whole chapter of the Bible to them. But go out and share what you learned about Jesus today. There may be something that, that may help someone else that day as well. 
When you think of the promises in Revelation, he said if you overcome through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus promises he'll give you of the fruit of the tree of life. He'll protect you against the second death. He'll give you manna and a little white stone with a new name. He'll keep your works until the end and he'll give you the morning star and authority over the nations. You'll be clothed in white garments and your name will not be removed from the book of life. He'll recognize you before his father and the angels. He'll make you a column in God's sanctuary and you'll be forever with him. The name of God will be written on you. And you will sit on his throne because he has already overcome and he's prepared the way for you. That's the message to the church of Laodicea. So finally he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You have gone through several studies, seven, eight studies, on the churches in the book of Revelation and what their meaning is for your life. And what Jesus is encouraging us to do here, take the things that you've learned and apply them. Don't close that book and go home and put it on your bookshelf and say, well, now I've got some Bible, Bible things written down. I'll put them in my bookshelf. We went to visit a, a young man years ago. He had all kinds of spiritual books because he collected them. He didn't read them. He just, he collected them. And he, he had like this nice shelf and some of them are like still in the covers. And you think, what is the point? You know, Jesus is wanting to make personal connection with us. And the reason for all of these messages, the reason for the encouragement, even for the church of Laodicea, who is so much in need Jesus says, I have what you need as well. So he's inviting each of us in our closing prayer. I invite you, if you have not found a, a connection with Jesus, I invite you just at the time that we're praying, just say, Lord, come into my life. I don't know what all that means, but come into my life. Make things different. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your awesome love for us in sending Jesus into the world, sending him searching for us to invite us to that wedding feast in your kingdom. Lord, may we stop with all of the excuses. May we open our hearts to you and to your kingdom. And Lord, may we invite some others to go with us along the way. And Father, I want to thank you for Pauline's choice that she has made for baptism. I pray, Lord, that as we join in, in sharing that time with her, that the angels of heaven will come down and camp round about us, would bless and draw heaven a little bit closer to us that day. In Jesus' name, amen.